Welcome everyone to the session Repair Safe While Continuing Operations Theory of Constraints by Wolfram. We are glad Wolfram could join us today and he's joined us from Germany. Wolfram is the founder of bluedolphin.world and his purpose is to make the knowledge how to reach high performance in shortest possible time available for all organizations. Today he will share his experience in overcoming problems in safe implementation to generate float 2.0. We are very excited to hear that, Wolfram. Yeah, thanks you a lot. And I'm, I'm very happy to be abroad in India. So hello world, hello India. And uh, maybe um, a, f a very few words to me so you can a little understand uh, who's talking here about uh, SAFE and, and repairing SAFE. Um, my name is Wolfram Müller and um, I'm an engineer, so very technical driven. A software developer and um, I was responsible maybe you know the company one and one.com um, an international internet service provider a worldwide active and I was there responsible for the project management office so I was responsible in my time there for over 500 product developments um, and projects with a lot of people 40 project managers thousands of uh, developers around the world so, and you can imagine internet, internet service provider. It was a very, very interesting dynamic uh, time. Um, and we had to react very fast. So we started in 2002, 20 years ago, already with Agile. And you can believe me, we did all the mistakes uh, you can do. And once in this um, delivering all the projects and products, we came, um, to this idea of theory of constraints. Um, and that was really a breakthrough for us in performance. And um, after that, I started, of course, uh, to distribute this knowledge. You heard about the Blue Dolphin, and we are now something around 70 people around the world supporting companies who, who want to reach this hyper productivity. And the interesting part is since a year, more and more um, companies are coming to us with uh, the question, oh, we implemented SAFE. Um, and um, this SAFE is not perfectly working in the way we expected it. Um, and therefore, we are asked uh, to support and help to repair this. And I will to show you a little how theory of constraints can help you in this. And as mentioned, um, below in the screen, you see the URL and the code. And I would invite you to open a browser, a handy or something like that. Um, then you see the, um, the screen here and you can um, uh, give your feedback and answers and stuff like this. So to have a little more interaction in this session. So, and you can forget about everything unless uh, you remember theory of constraints because that is the main key and the main idea uh, to get hyper productivity. So, and now the first, the first test whether Mentimeter is working uh, and to get a little warm with it. Um, what is your experience with SAFE? Huh? You heard about SAFE, maybe you are part of a SAFE implementation um, and now you can vote. Huh? Um, what is your experience? Got it worse? Was it more or less neutral? Um, Yes, it felt good. Uh, and as you heard, we are talking, or I'm often talking about hyper productivity. And we talk about hyper productivity if you reach factor two to five more throughput. So, really breakthrough throughput and uh, reduction of lead times by 50% and more. So, um, yes, as you see, it obviously works. Mentimeter is working. Um, we get the first votes in. So, and it's, it's a very typical uh, picture we see right now. Um, um, safe, yeah, sometimes it gets worse, but, but you, your experience is not like this. It's, it's very often very neutral, huh? so normal, uh, nothing really uh, big breakthrough. And uh, yes, of course, quite some organizations feel um, that, it, that they get more agile and that's fine. That's the that's main idea. But to be honest, there is no breakthrough. So, and that's, that's one of the things. 
and we are we got called of course from the blue ones uh, where it get more worse um, and that's my experience what I want to show here okay thanks you a lot so Mentimeter works and you're already familiar with and now I will um, uh, have three questions and slides because very often consultants are telling you, oh, you have to do this and that, and, and then everything gets fine. And I don't believe in this. Hmm? Uh, we are believing in assumption and physics of flow. And therefore, I just want to check you, check with you a few assumptions we have about the world. And you just have to vote yes or no, whether it fits for you. And I just explain it shortly. So, and the first assumption we have the goal of an organization has to be generate more outcome. And you know already the difference between outcome and output. Output is just putting something out. Outcome is if it is valued by the customer. And if it's valued by the customer, then he wants to pay for it. And then there is value for the customer. What do you think? Is this a valid goal for companies? And you are completely clear and I love it because that's a main, main, main breakthrough and idea really to generate outcome. And if outcome is generated, the company will uh, prosper and grow. So, and that's the first part. Thank you for this. Now it's getting a little more tricky. Um, uh, you already heard the theory of constraint stuff. And um, there's one assumption. And we have one assumption that it's impossible. Uh, that there are independent value streams. Hmm. So, and I showed there a picture on the left that are streets by night. And of course you could build streets from every house to every house without intersection. But that's very uh, resource intensive. And, and in the end, um, the fun of a network are the intersection where you can change uh, the routes and uh, make shortcuts. So we believe that it's impossible to have um, independent work streams. And you already see in the voting, huh? that's not so clear because a lot of consultants say you have to have independent streams and independent teams end to end. But in the end, all the breakthrough innovation are across. So just for you, our assumption is that uh, streets are interconnected, the internet is interconnected, and even the value streams are massively interconnected in a company. Otherwise, they would be two companies. Okay, thanks a lot. So now the next question, it's getting harder step by step. If you have such an interconnected network, and that's theory of constraint, then there will always be a constraint. So one interconnection should be the hardest of all. Um, and my question is how many of the constraints you know in a company? And this is interesting, the voting. Oh, and I'm, I'm, oh, 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 oh. That's going in the wrong direction, by the way. Huh? So, um, but that's that's a key part, and therefore I just can say, have a look in the theory of constraints. And the interesting part is, theory of constraint assumes, and we we've, we've seen that in practice, there is there is always one constraint that is harder than all the others, and this one constraint rules all. And if you find this constraint. Every, everything in management gets very easy because you just have to focus on this. Okay, so uh, you heard it. Uh, our, uh, our assumption is there's always one constraint and you have to find it. And on the left side, you see the picture of an airport and there's very clearly one constraint. It's a runway um, and it's everywhere in the world the same. And in IT organization, it's very often architecture, business engineering, or if, if it's not so mature, then it's DevOps and, and stuff like this. So keep aware, there's always just one constraint in a system. So thank you a lot. And now back to safe. Huh? Um, 
now you can uh, give your statement on a scale. Um, what do you think? How good is SAFE fulfilling the goal to improve outcome? Or the second scale is, um, what do you think does SAFE works perfect in a very complex value network with a lot of interconnection? And the, the last one is, um, hmm, in SAFE environments, do you see this constraint? It must be very, very, very uh, obvious and, and visible. And now I'm a little, little interested in what you think. Oh, it's something in between. Huh? So the goal stuff um, is fulfilled. Yes, I think so too. Huh? That's, that's clear. Uh, SAFE has the same goal than we. Um, and that's interesting that you think that, that the, the constraint is visible in SAFE and it can deal with complexity. There we will have a look at it. Huh? So um, there I'm a little surprised because we see a lot of trouble in SAFE uh, working with the dependencies. Um, and um, of course, we don't see the constraint in there. Okay, fine. That's always interesting to have a vote. Thank you for this. Now we go a step deeper. Huh? So that, that were the assumption. And now we are going one step nearer to the solution, how to repair safe. And um, uh, 10 years ago, something around that, I learned about self-organization and not the classical uh, standard way of self-organization, but the scientific approach of self-organization. And um, that's very interested how ants and organizations and physical systems are, are organized. And in the end, it's very, very simple. Um, it must be simple, otherwise it would not be a success story self-organization. Um, and in the end, you just have two principles or factors that um, decides whether you are successful or not. And it's very strange. The first one is very strange. All living organizations are underloaded. And that's a very, very, very important precondition. And you, you voted for, oh, there are more constraints. And very often, uh, this is an effect. Uh, if you are overloaded as organization, then you see, of course, more uh, constraints, then it looks chaotic. If you underload the organization, you will clearly see your constraint. So that's a very important precondition. And the other one is having a strong, very fast, transparent signal so that everyone knows about each other and what the state is, so he can decide in a way that's good for himself and for the organization. So that are the main main points if you want to use self-organization in a positive way you have to fulfill these two principles so and now this is very abstract um, and therefore I, I just took out my pen and sorry about my drawing ability is not so good but i tried to paint a crossroad huh? uh, like in the example before and the first question you always have is where is my constraint? And this is a simple, simple example, of course. So you immediately know where the constraint is. It must be the area of the crossing, the crossing area, because uh, there are just one or two cars can be in and on the streets, you have at least four times more capacity. So uh, in a cross section, um, it's always this area uh, where the streets are crossing. Okay, that's clear. And then the next question is typically, okay, if I have a constraint, I will, I will use it 100%. That's the optimum. So, um, but what happens if you really reach 100% usage? Uh, uh, very often this is called traffic disruption, but the, the, the bigger problem is, if anything happens and you are fully loaded, what happens then? You will never be able to recover. 
So that means if you promise your customer 100% of your ability capacity and, and just a small thing happens, you will never be able to catch up. So it's not a good idea to load the constraint at 100%. But what is acceptable, and maybe you know uh, queuing theory and stuff like this, it depends a little on the fluctuations, but um, more or less a rule of thumb is um, something around 80% is already much huh? um, to recover from any, any incidents and stuff like this, uh, bugs or, or misunderstandings. So 80% is a good, good number for the planned load of the constraint. Uh, and then the next question is, okay, if um, uh, what is the acceptable average load in the inflow then, of course? And the interesting part is that it must be even below that huh? because otherwise if a problem occurs uh, somewhere else, it's also not able to recover. And if it's more inflow than the capacity of the constraints over the long run, uh, you will have a huge backlog um, and the lead time will go down. So therefore it's so important to really understand this principle of self-organization you have to underload the organization. And now um, that means, and uh, if we work with C-levels, we often let them speak out loud the sentence, resources have to wait for work. So if you really want to have a flowing system, then the people, the developer or whoever, um, they have the ability to, to do uh, their job. And then they wait shortly, not very long, and then the next work package comes, and that means the work is flowing in optimal speed. And optimal speed means optimal outcome, um, uh, optimal time to market. So underloading the system is a precondition for really hyper-performant organization. It's not hard to sell, but it's a precondition. So that was principle one. And principle two is the transparent signaling. That's a little more complex, um, but the question is always, if you do not have a transparent signaling, what will happen? All the cars will run into the uh, cross section. You will have a traffic jam and the output is nearly zero. Um, the, the next thing is, um, is it possible to manage such a system if everyone just knows his car and nothing about the others? It's not possible. Even in a self-organized system, you need a very fast uh, signaling system where all the cars are um, to decide huh, um, whether you can go into this cross-section or not. And by the way, if you let the, the individual cops uh, decide on their own, then um, yeah, they will always decide to go into and you always has lost. So. Um, there must be something like a starts control. Um, and in, in a cross section, it's easy, it's a traffic light. And uh, you can believe me, um, all traffic lights are centrally um, controlled. That means there's somewhere a computer, he has an overview where uh, the cars are, and um, they, they do the traffic light, huh? they, they do the starts control. So it's nearly impossible, uh, as I say nearly, uh, to negotiate the right, um, the right inflow because the local and egoism uh, prevents to really uh, get the optimum. Um, and uh, that's the last question or the second last question. What's the core of this starts control? And that's, it's, it's not directly the flow in the uh, cross section, but it's a queue length. So all the modern uh, traffic light controls look at the queues and the longest queue will get uh, more resources of the constraint so that the overflow, uh, the overall flow is smooth. So, it, and as I said, it's a more, it's a little more abstract, um, but, but uh, it's very important to know that if you underload the organization, then you still have the need of a, a some kind central um, signaling system, a very light white ones, a very fast ones to really get the starts control 
done in a way so that everyone gets the precious uh, constraint resource. Um, and uh, the last question is, okay, uh, if there are just two cars, such a signaling makes no sense. Uh, and if it's completely overloaded, then it makes also no sense. So it's uh, connected. You can't have a good signaling system in an overloaded system. It makes no sense. Um, so these both principles are very tightly knitted together. So, wow, um, sorry about this section. Um, that is the base, huh? that are the principles you can read about this. Um, that's the base of all what we are thinking. Uh, my question to you, does these two principles make sense to you? Are they reasonable? Wow, that's good, because the interesting part of this is you can look at whatever system. Huh? You will find these two principles in our body, um, in anthill, in, in the traffic system, in companies. Um, these are universal systems for all living uh, beings and organizations. So it's very important to understand and the hardest part is, of course, the underloading. <laughs> um, but that's a key for hyper performance. So, and the, the next question is okay, you have a little experience with SAFE. Um, is it in a safe environment really like this that resources are waiting for work? Is it in a safe environment really like this that every day everyone knows where his story is? what the, the end and the start date and what's the status? Every day, I'm talking really about every day. And I'm talking about resources are waiting for work. Okay, interesting. I thought this is more clear <laughs> and and the voting would be more clear but it's it's interesting for me also to have such votings uh, to learn about now i would would be interested in having a discussion why you think that there is an everyday signal but we have i learned afterwards a hangout possibility so we can discuss about this further but um um the underload that's a real problem of safe because everyone pulls uh, in his PI planning or whatever, and they are all 100% working all the time. Um, so they are not waiting for work. Hmm, that's stupid somehow. And the signaling, yes, it's there, of course, on the team layer, but um, on, the, on the coordination layer and on the portfolio layer. Uh, so on the overall portfolio, it's not very clear what my story has as a status for everyone else. So, and now it's all about fixing this. Um, as I said, since a year, more and more safe implementations are coming to us. We have now a, a list of 19 fails and stuff like this. And um, what we see is safe is very, very clear in the goal, a more outcome. Um, uh, many, many consultants are telling the people that it's very important to have independent teams and value streams end to end, but this is seldom the case. Um, the constraint is not visible. It's not clear who is constraining the output of the overall system. And um, if everyone pulls work, everyone is busy. Um, you will see, of course, then many constraints, a, a lot of uh, discussions. Uh, about priorities and dependencies. And sorry, I don't see a team over uh, spanning signaling where my uh, story is. So on the coordination layer, um, you, the only thing you have to do or can do is talk. So uh, sorry, that was uh, the safe bashing part. I don't want to bash safe, it's it's fine, but it ha it really has to be improved. And um, now that's, that's, I think, the, the most critical or hardest uh, question. Um, if you now have the job to, to repair such an, a situation, then you have different 
possibilities what you can do first. So you can do first optimize the flow in the team. Uh, you can first implement uh, dependency or coordination management. You can implement uh, lean portfolio management. And my question to you is, if you if you have the job to save, save, uh, what do you think should be done first? Wonderful. Okay. Oh, that, that I really like. Hmm? Um, because I, I think safe is not so bad at all, but they do the stuff in the wrong order. So when we are working with companies to get hyper productivity, the first thing is to identify the constraint and underload the organization. Uh, and then you have the head free for change and doing new stuff. The second thing we are doing is the signaling. Uh, so, so you rated the dependency and project management as third one. We, we typically use this as the second one. And then if you have the signals and the underload, then it makes absolutely sense to optimize the flow in the team. And now, now I just want to show you four concepts out of theory of constraints. I don't want to go so much in detail, uh, but just to give you a, a short impression about this. Um, and uh, afterwards I show you where you can get more, more details. But when we are going into a safe or any other organization, um, the first thing we are doing is we activate the lean portfolio management, but not in this general term like described in SAFE, but really based on the theory of constraints. And that means, and it sounds a little stupid or awkward, but there are strategic deliveries for each organization. We, we put them on a list um, and the customers or the organization put some low data, huh? very rough estimation, what skills they need and how much of them. Then you simply add every leads um, together and you compare it to the capacity of the skills and then you have the constraint identified. That's a picture in the uh, left above. Huh? So these are the queue length and if the, the demand is over the capacity, then it's get red. And then you have to decide which of the deliveries you postpone or uh, throw away in the fridge or something like that. So it's a real decision, hard decision um, to cut the overall strategic backlog down until the constraint is in underload. So that's, that's what we are calling freezing. Um, after the freezing, you, you have a little more information um, you see where, you're, where you have capacities. And by the way, Skype did it a few years ago and they found 50% spare capacity by doing this. And then of course you readjust your team sizes so uh, that the constraint um, is better loaded. The pictures below show the roadmap and the, the red stuff is always uh, the constraint usage. Um, and the, the game is all about um, not overloading the constraint. And if you don't overload the constraint, every other team is not overloaded. Very typically teams are loaded with 50 to 60% plant load. And that also allows them to do sharpen the X um, to improve the way of working, learn. So uh, protective capacity, spare capacity is not bad at all. It's necessary. Um, to evolve and uh, increase flow. So if you do this, uh, the constraint is an underload and all other teams have spare capacity. And you can't imagine if you do this, and we did it 35 times, um, it's already a completely different organization you have. So the next thing that's a little more complex, sorry about this, and maybe you read the first book of David Anderson, he um, introduced a concept out of theory of constraint called Ram Buffer Rope. This is a book of David, 
a lot of thing has uh, evolved. So uh, we are using this uh, simplified round buffer concept for queues. And um, if you look at a, a safe uh, installation implementation, each team looks like an ordered queue of deliveries. That's very easy to do uh, with Jira or whatever. And each of these items has, a, we call it standard lead time. So if it is the only thing to do, it takes maybe a week or two weeks or something like that. And this queue, that's a picture above, you just put everything uh, behind each other and then you divide a little by the capacity you have then you have the planned load that is the end of the queue. So, and uh, if a new item is coming in, uh, you can easily say when you have to stay, uh, start and stop, uh, when you can deliver. So this is a very simple heuristic about determining, determining for each item um, a due date. So, and we did it uh, with Steve Tendon together with a four and a half thousand developer company, 120 teams, easily to do. And then everyone knows about start and end dates um, of his item. Um, and uh, the goal is to deliver in yellow. So if um, um, an item comes to red, someone takes care. And this we call expediting. Um, and uh, out of the expediting, you learn what was the problem. Um, and then you can fix the process. If there are too many items finished in green, then you reduce the lead times. So, and the, the success story of this is no one has to ask. You don't need to have a PI planning. Um, everyone knows when his items are coming and you do this green, red, yellow stuff and expediting, you really can be sure that it is delivered. Well, sorry about this. So there are much more details afterwards you can request. And if you have um, for each uh, story um, a due date, then you can do a very simple project management on top. That is the middle layer that is very complex in, um, in safe. You have to talk a lot to manage the dependencies. With a drum buffer row below, it's very simple. So just two examples. Um, if you have a small, bigger release, an epic or strategic delivery that contains maybe three stories in three different queues, and they have to be finished at the same time, then you simply can look in the queues where your parts are, um, and you just take the last delivery date, and then you know when the overall is delivered, you can also build dependencies. Um, and, and that's a very, very simple way um, to do project management. You simply have to look uh, where your parts are. And if one of these parts are too late, then you can look what's before you in the queue, you know uh, with whom you have to talk, and uh, then you can uh, talk with him and he's willing to postpone his part. Um, then, then you can easily do decisions, um, trade-offs, and it's very easy to get a reliable due date for even bigger complex uh, deliveries with many parts. Um, we've done this too in many companies. Um, and uh, the idea is really, and you can do it all the time. Uh, you, you have all the data all the day. Um, and this leads to a very simple preparation of PIPs because everyone already knows everything, the dependencies, um, the due dates. And then you simply have to talk about the strategy, strategy um, about the context and all the stuff around, but not solving these dependencies because they are already solved. And the last fix or the last part is this flow in teams. Um, maybe you realize that Steve Tendon in three hours has also a speech here. Uh, together with Steve Tendon, I wrote the book, Tame the Flow. Um, and it's all about the perfect flow in teams. And that's very simple. Um, you have typically a task board and you manage your subtasks. I prefer the swim lane uh, version um, with uh, planned in progress and finished. And the only thing you have to do um, is to take care that less subtasks are open than people in the team. Um, everything else makes no sense in a knowledge working uh, environment. 
And if something is not um, able to flow or is there a problem, if, if it's an internal or external problem, you don't have to write an a impediment backlog or, or scrum master to ask for anything like this. Uh, I really prefer pull the line, stop working on, on anything else, fix the problem. And by doing this, you will really get very fast into very good flow if you solve your problems. And if you solve the problems, then reduce the subtask size so that the problems will occur faster and more um, until uh, you really reach perfect flow. And if you have the drum buffer rope stuff, uh, then you have a traffic light system. Um, and typically you put this traffic light also on the Kanban board or whatever. So you have a priority. And of course, if, if there is a red line, uh, then please help the people in the red and you will have um, optimal flow within days. Um, that, that's a last fix we um, promote really reduce the work in progress on team layer, layer um, less subtasks than people in the team, no backlogs, no blocking areas, pull the line and fix the flow. So that were the four, uh, the three, no, that, that are four fixes. And um, as, as I said, we do it very often. Hmm? Um, so um, just imagine, an organization that is in underload, would you love it? Or an organization where everyone knows about every story, where the status and the due date, very easy to manage, or an organization um, where the teams are in perfect flow. So would you love it or not? Okay, <laughs> that's interesting. I have to talk afterwards with the one who voted for, he does not love an underloaded organization. <laughs> okay, so you, I think you get the idea. And uh, I really can tell you, we have a lot of testimonials when people came to us and said, oh, it's so wonderful to work in an organization that is in underload. It's so, so relieving when you know where the stuff is. And I really am astonished working in a team with perfect flow. I, I really can uh, wish you this because that's the most wonderful thing. And a team that is in perfect flow and has no hurdles, um, that that shows a creativity that that is unbelievable so but you're a little on the right side you're not so um happy and in love with this stuff so i have to think about huh? and maybe in the hangout you can tell me why so and that's it huh? and it's no fantasy of mine uh, we do this since 10 years and um, just to give you a, a small impression, one of the biggest was uh, Telefonica Brazil with six and a half thousand employees. With these ideas, uh, they doubled the throughput. Other companies like Bush, they reduced the time to market by 35%, up to 70%, even after uh, five years doing lean. So, and, um, or, or for example, Mega within uh, 20 weeks, they quadru quadrupled the output and was in Hauser, more or less the same. So we have a lot of experience, 35 companies and um, a, a company that's in flow, that's also good for the people and um, the creativity comes back. Um, and it's, it's unbelievable. All these companies are now more or less market leaders in their area because they are simply faster. Um, uh, than all the others and just to, for, just for you here the a little the the overview and the main thing is we pull the portfolio management in the implementation of safe in the front in the beginning then we do this queuing stuff and this project management stuff to get the easy um easy dependency management 
And then, of course, uh, in the coaching area, we really think uh, and help the teams to reach flow. And that's it, more or less. So that was it from my side. Um, um, thanks for your time. And it was too short to show you everything of the last 10 years we did. Uh, so here are five links. Huh? Um, a lot of resources, everything for free. Um, you just can grab it and use it. There are tools, everything you need to know. And uh, the last thing is, I love India. I really do it. And we also have dolphins and supporters in India. So if you have questions afterwards to me, um, there's a mail and Aniruda will be happy to answer your questions, of course, too. So thank you. That was it from my side. Thank you, Wilfram. Wonderful session. So much to digest. <laughs> so <Yes>, much. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. It, it has been wonderful. Uh, we uh, we only have like two minutes, so maybe we can take one question now, and then remaining we can take in the hangout. So there is a question that asks, uh, in an organization, there can be more than one constraint is what I have seen. Of course, one could be predominant. So why do we say that there is only one constraint? Yeah. Um, of course, there can be two or more, huh? but it makes it very, very complex. And it's, it's as uh, the questioner said, there's a predominant one. Huh? And if you want to grow as an organization, then you have to focus on the most severe one. And therefore we say there's always one that dominates everything. And if you solve this, then you have of course the next one. So um, yes, there are in reality more than one, but uh, the idea is to have one and focus on one and then the next one. Sure, yeah. Makes sense. Yep. And thank you so much, Wilfram, for sharing your experience with us today. <laughs>